is so cool. <clears throat> Man, I just, um, seriously, I just bumped into somebody backstage and they were like, dude, did you know the, the tomb is empty? Yeah! All right. Welcome to the first Heavy Metal Church of Christ. I'm Brian Smith. If you're watching or listening for the first time today, please check us out at heavymetalchurch.com on Facebook under the first Heavy Metal Church of Christ, Instagram under Heavy Metal Church, YouTube under Heavy Metal Church. Hey, and we are going to start something new. Um, finally got rid of Vimeo. It took me forever. I tried to because we use YouTube now, so I was going to try to stop paying Vimeo, and they said we were going to lose 500 of our videos if we, and I'm like, uh, so I've spent the last couple of months downloading every single message that we've ever done since our first year anniversary in 2012. <sighs> Man. So I just finished it this morning. So, yes. So with that being said, I think we're going to start, um, we're going to start something called the Heavy Metal Vault or the Heavy Metal Archives or something like that. And then every, since we don't do a Sunday night service or a Wednesday night service, maybe on one of those two days at like seven o'clock at night, I'll start all the way back from the beginning and each week post a message because I know we have a lot of first timers or a lot of newer uh, members and all that kind of stuff and throughout the years and everything so you can watch it from the beginning. I'm just so, I, I'm going to be a little vain right now. I don't like the way I look back then. I'm serious. I was a raunt, man. I'm, uh, I'm talking and then trying to grow this biker beard and all this stuff for the first year and it's just like, and then so, yeah, try not to laugh too much. At least pause it just for a minute. Just get your laughing out of the way and then hear the word of God because I wish I would have started doing this from day one. But, you know, again, I started this with um, a pack of or a box of cheap New Testament only Bibles, Christians that give Jesus a bad name with no pictures and eight by 11 form and bam, you know, so it was great. Um, just the history of this. So anyway, I'm going to start doing that. Might even start it tonight. And let's go ahead. We're going to start a series right now. And uh, hopefully, I pray that you guys will get something out of it. The past uh, couple of weeks, we were talking about forgiveness, which that's the F word for Christians. It really is. Um, can anybody be honest and show of hands how many of you actually took the letter challenge and wrote a letter or contacted somebody from your past? Two. Okay. Well, the rest of you, I encourage you continue to pray about that because we all have people um, that we could reconcile with or try to, you know, whatever. It's just all it's going to do is improve your walk with Christ. So for the two of you that did that, praise God. And I know God's going to bless you for that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and watch the last two weeks uh, of messages. And it was convicting, man. I, I wrote one letter, made one phone call maybe two phone calls. I've want maybe like a, an email, a letter and two or something like that. I, it, it convicted me too. And I'm still going to keep pressing forward. I'm constantly asking God to put on my heart. You know, I want to be the best I can be for Christ, man. And I'm never going to be perfect, but that doesn't mean we should not try. And I, you know, we should tie up all of our loose ends, but, and then the two most important, um, commandments, you know, everybody's like, well, the Bible's just got all these rules. There's two rules. That's love the Lord, thy God with all of your, all of your soul, mind, body, spirit, because if you do that, and then the second one is love everybody else, like you love yourself. If you really focus on doing that, the 10 commandments are just going to fall into place the, I mean, cause you're not going to, if you're loving your neighbor, like you love yourself, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to, you know, be with their spouse. You're not going to, you know what I mean? So anyway, we take that serious. And, uh, today we're going to dive into, um, I'm just going to go, you'll figure it out eventually what the series is going to be about. But some of you have had, um, some here, excuse me, some of you here and many Christians uh, live defeated Christian lives, man. You're defeated all the time uh, because, first of all, you're blind to spiritual warfare. Um, a lot of Christians, oh, that's just hyper faith or that's just this and that, you know. And then 
the ones, and then there's many that ignore it um, or, are, or are ignorant on how to fight it. And sorry, I usually don't stumble that much. I was jotting that down <laughs> in the back room. But let me say that again. Some of you here and many Christians live defeated Christian walks, your Christian lives, because you are blind to spiritual warfare. Some of you doubt that it even exists. And then also you're ignorant on how to fight it. So we're going to start in 1 Peter 5, 5 through 11. That's 1 Peter 5, 5 through 11. And it says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders, all of you. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud. I know many proud Christians, but shows favor to the humble. And that's how we want to strive for our hearts to be. And that's pliable so the Lord can mold us and shape us like uh, wet clay, you know, moist and wet clay. And um, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I love that, um, that meme that has the little boy peeing in the weeds, and it says, the less you care, the happier you'll be. And that's the truth. Cast all you, what, what, what makes, it's the anxieties and the cares of this world that, that gets us. You know, and it's like, God, that was never supposed to be the life for us was constant worry, constant anxiety. Let it go. Let it go. And then just enjoy God. Enjoy your family. Enjoy your children and grandchildren. Enjoy your aunts and uncles, whatever it may be, your spouse. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while with him himself, restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, the, amen. Yeah. And there's a thing that's taken place. You know, we look at our brothers and sisters in Christ overseas. Their battles are their lives. They are getting tortured. There, there are more persecuted Christians getting killed. Mur I forget what it was, something like a, how many, like a hun over a hundred thousand and so many months or it's crazy. I'm talking burned alive, heads cut off, drowned in cages. The women are raped or sold into sex slavery or turned into Muslim, um, sex objects to be passed around. It, it, it's, it's in here. We're so spoiled over here. Our persecution over here is more here. In the mind, um, splitting congregations with, with slander and with division and with, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Satan don't have to try too hard um, over here in America. He, he, don't, he joins the churches. It's not the, it's not the world over here in America that's going to come after Christians. It's brother and sister so-and-so in Christ. Am I right? Okay, because a lot of people, they'll go to one church, oh, praise God, then somebody ticks them off, and then they go church hopping until they find another church, and then Ethel over here will say something or look at them, or maybe Ethel's a douche, who knows, but anyway, instead of loving and forgiving, they church hop, and then they badmouth their old, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. That is how Satan is messing America up, the American church up. Um, so there is a battle that most people are either unaware of or they just simply don't take serious. And I used to be one of those people. Um, you see, I'll make fun of people that'll say, oh, I got a flat tire on the way to work. The Lord's really, me or the, the, the enemy's really messing with me. No, dummy, you hit a nail. All right. We're, we're dry. It's a man-made object. It breaks down. It's this, there's problems in this life. And that's not the case, you know. If you're not walking a life, if you're not walking a path striving to be the best Christ follower that you can be, striving to apply God's word to your life, striving to make disciples of all men, if you're not one of those Christians, Satan ain't even messing with you because you're not a threat. He don't care if you come here every Sunday. He don't care if you have perfect church attendance. 
It's when you go out there and do something with the word of God and try to make uh, followers and believers out of people, then he's going to start messing with you. Until then, you're safe. And that's not really safe because you're disappointing God because you are not doing what you're supposed to do as a Christ follower. Well, who are you to tell me that? I'm not. If you knew your Bible, you would know that that's God telling you that, and I'm just up here telling you what that says. So you can't yell at me. That's what uh, that God you say you believe in says, okay? So blamed everything on Satan and uh, only really went to, you know, fell down on my knees when my life was falling apart or I needed that raise or I wanted that, you know, I was an immature baby Christian back in the day, took God for granted and, and didn't really know what this war was about until I naively stepped out of the boat and said, use me, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll accept this challenge that I kicked and screamed and fought and cried over. And he had to give me the courage to time and time again to do this. And then I saw a very real enemy that is real, that is there to seek, kill, destroy, to cause you to stumble time and time again. Um, it, it's kicked my butt for 10 and a half years. But the thing is, God is true and just. God is all powerful. And if you just keep with the power source, sometimes you feel like death and sometimes you feel like you're sinking, but he won't let you die. That's war. That's battle, okay? Um, and again, I'm, I'm already rambling. I'm on page two. This is a series, so don't worry, guys, because if I only get through second page today, we've got, got a long way to go. So it, re it reminds me, my stepdad, I've told you this story before, but he was in Vietnam, and uh, every now and then, every so many months or whatever, you would get a, a pass to get, they would helicopter you out of Nam, take you to a cushy Air Force base that was close or something like that. And you could take a hot shower, you could clean up, get a good meal, have a couple of days on the weekend and then go back. Well, there were two, they called them grunts. And the, they, no, this is what my dad said. He goes, yep, they called us grunts. And two of my friends uh, were taking a shower in the Air Force uh, men's you know, room and two Air Force guys come in and they start, well, it smells like grunting here, like that. And, you know, they had the cushy desk jobs far away from the battle, you know, probably haven't even gotten a splinter, perfect pedicure, manicure, you know, they're whatever. And you've got two guys that's been living in foxholes that are the horrific conditions for months and weeks and months and, and whatever on end. So needless to say, I'm happy to tell you that those two Air Force guys got their butt kicked right there in the shower. Uh, good stuff. Naked, too. That would be a fun fight, wouldn't it? And uh, I'm kidding. And, you know, and that's what I'm trying to explain to you today. You've got Christians that are in it to win it, that are all in, that take the Bible series, take God's Word series. They are trying to better themselves through God's Word. Their prayer life is as strong as they possibly can make it. They know God's Word, and they are trying to save their lost family, friends, enemies, and acquaintances, okay? And then there's those that want to come and sit down every Sunday and yeah, okay, I went to church, I did this, I dropped a five in the plate, I'm a good Christian, you know what I'm saying? And then say, well, our church did this last year, we did this, we really didn't do a thing. You just came on Sunday. And that's good, that's a good start. But you have your brand new issued jersey on, you are sitting on the bench watching the battle take place I want you to imagine like this, you've got, how many people are on a foosball team? Out on the field, nine, 11, 12. Let's just call it 11 and a half, all right? Because there's always a short guy. No, I'm joking. So 11 people out on the foosball field and they're getting bloodied, they're getting bones broken and all this kind of stuff. And then they win the game. And then you've got the 20 or so bench that are, yeah! yeah, we won, man, woo, 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 you know, and you've got the battle guys coming in like boom, boom. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be a bench-sitting Christian. I don't, man, never again, because I used to be one. I used to be one. I don't ever want to be that again. Have you ever been sitting in a chair only to find that you've drifted off to sleep 
but it's only upon awakening that you become aware that you even fell asleep. You know what I'm saying? What? <laughs> Many times. Um, just don't be a truck driver doing that, okay? Until you awoke, you didn't know you were asleep. And that is how it is with deception. You don't, you do not know you are deceived until you awake from your deception. A deceived person will not even check to see if they are deceived. I mean, why would they? They do not know that they are being deceived. There's deceived people everywhere, everywhere. Deception is a powerful tool that Satan uses on the human race for its destruction. And Satan's deception is very subtle and mixed with some truth to make it palatable. Let's take a look at a couple of deceptions that Satan has successfully placed in God's church in these last days. Now again, when I was, I guess, lukewarm or a bench setter or whatever, and uh, the only time I ever got on fire for God was uh, when I was facing a hard time in life or, you know, every now and then, you know, I was young, so every now the next, the, Jesus is coming back because here's the final, you know, whatever. <gasps> oh, I gotta get by! You know, kind of like when 9-11 happened and uh, all of your, there's no small kids, all your half-assed Christians uh, started filling the, filling the churches and stuff and they had the, high, the highest church attendance in years and it lasted for a few months until they realized, oh, okay, false alarm. And they just slowly started to trickle off and it went back to normal, okay? God's not gonna honor that. You know what I'm saying? You're either in or you're out, you're either hot or you're cold and um, that's it. And it wasn't until I took a leap of faith and obedience and I saw a real war taking place. A war that only affects Christ followers that are in the game, say in the game, and not just sitting on the bench claiming victory, just like I, you know, and you know, bench setters, they, if they keep practicing hard and all that kind of stuff, hopefully they will get in the game someday. But I wanna be the people getting bloodied out on field. Um, if you are a lukewarm Christian, there is an enemy trying to keep you there, okay? Plain and simple. If you are a self-righteous Christian, oh, there's so many of those uh, holier-than-thou, goody-two-shoe, self-righteous types. If you are one of those, there is an enemy trying to keep you there. If you are a non-believer, there's an enemy trying to keep you there, and I think a lot of times he just shows the stupidity of Christians. And that's, uh, that's easy enough to keep somebody from not wanting to step foot in the church. If you're on fire for God, there is an enemy trying to get you to turn down the heat to room temperature, to lukewarm. And listen, he won't mess with you when you're on fire. When you're all filled with the Holy Spirit, you're like, yeah! He'd be stu he's smart. He's a military genius. He'd be stupid to mess with you then. Humans are notorious for getting lazy, complacent. You know what I'm saying? It's like... You start getting used to something, you start getting, that's why the whole pizza bus thing, I've decided to just do it once a month to keep them excited and thankful and happy and not to take it for granted. We are so easy. The easier we make our lives, the easier it is for us to become sloth and lazy and, and whatever. I mean, look, we're the most out of shape nation in the history of nations and it's because we've got it too easy. Um, so he'll strike when, when you are not like, woo, you know, for God. So, I mean, think about it though. Think about deception um, and how easy, you know, that to be, if you don't know your Bible, that's why I always say, don't take my word for it. See, I should just be saying, unless you're a baby Christian and you're learning and everything and you're growing, if you're a mature Christian here today, I should just be saying stuff that you've already known that the Bible says just in a different way or stuff to make you think and the Holy Spirit can target your heart or we, we need that constant reminder you know, that forgiveness. Who, who would have known? We're supposed to forgive, you know, and we do a message on forgiveness for two weeks. Like, oh crap, I've been living these past couple of years with loose ends with this person and this person. Oh no, I got to contact that person, you know? So we're growing, we're sharpening iron here, but think about it. Jehovah's Witness, some of the nicest people I've ever met. I mean, I, and they, it, Satan, that military genius just removed a little here, a pinch here, and it's a false doctrine. You know what I'm saying? It's the it's, same way with Mormons, and I have nothing against, and my best friend's a Mormon. 
totally. But they changed just, and it's the most important stuff that Jesus was God in human form, period. But the Mormons and Jehovah's Witness do not believe that. And that's the meat and potatoes is that he was God in human form. He rose from the dead. Um, I, I, Jehovah's Witness, Witness sent me an Easter uh, pamphlet one time in my mail and it said, the, the greatest death of all time. The greatest death of all time. And I was thinking, my God's alive. You know what I'm saying? Jesus is alive. And um, so it's so easy, just a slight to be deceived, man. You know, there's other Christians that believe, like I think it's called, uh, yeah, universalism. There's universalist Christians out there that believe all that Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and it paid the price for all time. That everybody, I said, so you telling me Adolf Hitler's going to heaven? Yeah. And I'm like, what? So what's the point? Why does the Bible say we're supposed to go out and save lost people? And he goes, well, don't you want your lost family and friends to know the beauty and the peace of God? I'm like, peace? I was like, ever since I stepped foot out of this boat to save lost people, my life's been hell on earth. And the only thing keeping me going is the peace of the Holy Spirit and the joy of knowing where I'm going after this. But my life's been pure hell since I've taken the Bible serious. How much, how it'd be so easy. I wish universalism was true. Because then my people that I love so much that still haven't accepted Christ, I know would make it. But that's not the truth. That's not the truth. That is, that is a lie. That's why you got to know God's word and you have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit because I've seen solid Christians get mad because of whatever. I'm not going to go straight in, you know, get sidetracked. But they got so mad at God over something. Well, I guess I do need to tell you. Um, they, they lost uh, one of their friends, high school friends. This was a long time ago. And he was a Muslim, and he died in a car accident. And it really bothered this woman. And how could it not bother? You know, I mean, that's sad. And she come up, she goes, so are you telling me that if he wasn't saved and said a prayer and that because he's Muslim, he's going to hell? And I said, well, listen, you don't know the last seconds and all that stuff of somebody's life. Many Muslims, many Muslims are converting to Christ, okay? I was like, but... Yes, I'm sorry. I have to tell you the truth no matter how bad it hurts. And please don't get mad at me. But I have to let you know that if somebody dies and Jesus Christ has not been confessed as their Lord and Savior in repentance of sin, and they believe that God, God raised him from the dead, and they are, yeah, he didn't make it. And next thing I know, they quit. And I'm being slammed all over Facebook as a hate monger as uh, I'm a hate pastor, pastor filled with hate, all of this stuff. And I mean, I about cried over that because I don't want anybody going to hell, okay? And I mean, because that's, that's, a, that's a real place. And the last I heard, and these were solid Christians, but it affected her so much that the last time, she denounced it. Months went by, they tried that universalist stuff. And then the next thing I know, um, she's into Wicca now. Okay, and, and I feel so bad for them because the truth can hurt. And that's why we are supposed, we don't know which one of our loved ones and everything is going to go next. But what we do know is they're all going to go. We're going to go. And that is why with urgency, not trying to shove a book of rules down somebody's face, but the love of Christ the love of Jesus, it is a free gift, and you don't have to change anything about your life because he's going to clean you up along the way. You just focus and confess, repent, and let's get to know Jesus together, and we're just going to love the hell out of you through the cleanup process. But here's the thing. We're all in the cleanup process. So whether John Boy over here has been saved for 20 years or you for 20 minutes, John Boy better never appear to have his, that his poo-poo doesn't stink at the first heavy metal church of Christ because I will assure him it does as I show him the door. Love, because we are all sinners saved by grace 
And that's it. I mean, it doesn't give you a hall pass to sin, but you're going to mess up. I'm going to mess up. And God is true and just to forgive a repentant heart. Deception. Um, Satan's most successful tool. He wields this tool with devastating results. Just think of all the people that followed David Koresh and Jim Jones. Those are just two. That, there was, there's been tons of false prophets throughout the, the years and the ages. It's like, how can you take somebody that believes in Jesus, then you've got some smooth tongue devil up there. Oh, I'm a, God told me I got special. If I ever come in here, first of all, pray for me that I never do because that means I got compromised. All right. But if I ever, ever, ever come in here and tell you anything that goes against God's word, and then I say, but I had a special revelation from God. I want you to get up and leave. For real. I've told you that time and time again. If I pull up in a rich man's car, leave. Leave. If I buy $3,000 suits, if you see me wearing anything else besides comfort clothes and the one suit that I own for weddings and funerals from Men's Warehouse, leave. Okay? Um, We teach truth here. And I'll go horn to horn, toe to toe with all these people that are telling you you're going to go to hell for smoking a cigar. No, you're not. All right. Um, they're, they're, they're making it too hard. You know what I'm saying? And is it smart to smoke cigarettes? I'm going to defend cigars because I don't inhale. But it does say on the package that even though you don't inhale, it can still. So, okay. Okay. Is it, is it smart? No. But these, these are people telling me I'm going to hell for smoking a cigar that are obese and they eat fast food five times a week. So don't tell me about a clean temple, hoss. You know, I mean, you agree? I'm not, hey, I need to lose some, especially turning 50. It's almost like I felt the dial turn down at midnight on my 50th birthday. The metabolism just keeps going down. What's that? Shut up. So, deception, Satan's most successful tool. Think about David Koresh. He convinced grown men and women that God said, I'm allowed to have sex with your wife. Okay, David. You know what I'm saying? God would never do that. That goes against his word. God's not a hypocrite. But people are so easily deceived. He uses doubt, makes you question God's word and his goodness. How many times I have heard that, how could a loving God, how could a loving God, you know, when uh, something happens, a pedophile or um, rape or murder or molestation, or how could a loving God allow these horrific things? I don't know how to tell you. He doesn't. This is, a, this is not what he will. He does allow it. Listen. This, this, li- this world, uh, the best way I can describe it is it used to be a watch that never needed winding. It was a perfect creation, you know, um, with all of that. And then as soon as Satan um, come onto the scene and deceived Adam and Eve, it became a wristwatch that needs wound up. And this world, since sin had been brought into this world, is a wristwatch that's tick, 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 and it's ticking down to its last talk. All right, and there's going to be some junk happening in that time. And oh, look at this world, how evil it is. Look, we were told and warned about it. We were warned ahead of time about it, okay? God did not want this to happen. Um, I read an article. It was so cool. I posted it on my Facebook today, and um, the author, he goes, yeah, he goes, the human body is just almost a perfect creation. He was talking about just how complex and beautiful the body is, and I was like, I just wanted to tell him, I wish I could, that, well, it used to be 100% perfect, and then sin come into the you know, sin and death and disease and murder and rape and all of these things. But the body was perfect and was never going to die until sin got brought into the scene. And that's Satan's fault. So the world is that wristwatch, you know, 
and uh, it was, we were supposed to last forever. He uses discouragement. Oh, man. Makes you look at your problems rather than at God. How many people have just been through stuff that it seems so overwhelming, and for a minute you just forgot about God, you know, because all you can focus on is this problem. Only three? Seriously? You guys asleep? What's up? Man, I want your life if, if you don't have these problems. Um, he uses discouragement, makes you look at your problems rather than God. Diversion makes the wrong things seem so attractive, so you want them more than the right things. The world is a cesspool of evil that must take its course to separate the sheep and the goats. But how easy it is to get, up, to get caught up on materialism. I want to know if, if some of these gazillionaire pastors if they would give up their mansion to save one murder, like one murderer, you know, that was going to go to hell, if they could just save his soul, would they give up their mansion to save that soul? You know what I'm saying? And we got to watch it because everybody's saying, nope, 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 he wouldn't. But would you give up your 401k, something that you've worked all your life for? Would you give up your brand new vehicle to save somebody's soul and then you still have to make the payments on it even though you don't have it anymore. Think about it. And it's easy to say, yes, sir, in this front row. And I believe your heart. I do. But it, I've seen so many, yep, yep, yep. Like the, it drives me crazy when, when people say, yep, I'd never deny God. Let that Muslim cut my head off. Oh, it's so easy to say here on your protected neighborhood with your AC and your cable television. You pee your pants if you're in that real scenario, and I hope you do have the faith and strength, but it's not your faith and strength. It would be God through you, and God can't stand arrogance. I, I, I say that I pray with everything within me that God would give me the courage and strength like he gave Stephen, because I'm not a tough guy, okay? I would be peeing my pants if, if they come up to me with a knife getting ready to end my life that way. You feel me? I hate it when you guys are quiet, man. I'm just up here like, look, y'all right? I right. This world is a cesspool of evil. A cesspool of evil. He uses defeat. Anybody ever felt defeated? Oh, my goodness. He, um, or low self-esteem. Inferiority complexes. Defeat, low self-esteem, inferiority complexes makes you feel like a failure so you don't even try. Makes you feel like you're not good enough as Billy Bob over here or as whatever over here. So you're not even going to try because you can't do it. That's one of the first things Pastor Stan taught me in the leadership classes I took. Don't ever compare yourself to anybody. Don't compare yourself to me, Brian, because God uses me for this, 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 and this. He uses you for this, 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 and this. He goes... I can look and be like, oh man, I'm not as good as Billy Graham or something like that. And you can't do that because you are you. God made you. Everybody hold your hand up and repeat after me. There are people on this planet that only I can save with my unique personality that God gave me. And that's the truth right there. That's true for you and it's true for me. But Satan will use defeat, low self-esteem, and inferiority complexes to just keep you from doing, he'll just, for nothing, you're not going to do anything. He uses delay, makes you put off something so it never gets started or completed. Who's done that? Procrastination, man. Um, I got an email from a congregant a while back that reads, wow, I just got unfriended and called a lunatic for my faith-based biblical posts. That stung a little well, that stung a little bit. Satan keeps coming at me, Brian. And uh, other congregants, you know, once they took it serious, their marriage started to get attacked or started to be tested once they stood up to the plate. The devil looks for the tiniest chink in your armor. You know what I'm saying? It's, um, it's like an Achilles heel. If he can just get that steel toe boot in your door, you can't close that door. You can't. And I mean, it's... Um, yeah. When people first discover the first heavy metal church of Christ, they automatically think we play death metal in every service. I wonder why they think that. I don't know. But uh, coming next Sunday is Cannibal Corpse. Amazing Grace. No. 
I don't like that kind of music. I really don't. I'm a vocalist. You like that kind of music? Yeah, I don't. Leave the church now, please. Thank you. No, I'm joke. I kid. I kid. You praying for me? Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. No, I, I, I'm a vocalist. The music's great, but I don't. I call it Cookie Monster vocals. Roar, 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 cookie. Which Chris Cornell is my cat. You know what I'm saying? So I like to sing. So nothing against Cannibal Corpse. But okay. Anyway, so. When they first discover this church, they automatically think we played uh, death metal. But actually, and here's, you know, everything about this church is Trojan horse, horseish. Tro- horseish, horseish. He, you're a teacher. That's not a word, is it? But it is now, Scott. It is now. Because in, huh? Because in Jesus' name, I say it's a word. No, I'm kidding. Jesus. It's in Hezekiah. Look it up. So, hold on. Trojan horse ish. Everything about, like the Hellraiser, like the shirts, like the, um, it's amazing, you know. I, I love the way we could take that coach anywhere. I mean, seriously, and, or even the old bus, the old bus with the Iron Maiden font down the side, and, and, and people are, are just magnetized to it. I'm talking occultists, lost people, people that want nothing to do with church. We can go into the, the baddest biker. I mean, my goodness, man, you were uh, talking to a one percenter uh, in, uh, what's that, what part of Kentucky did we go to that had the motorcycle? Walton? Walton, Kentucky, for we were doing this blessing in the bikes thing, and this one percenter, if you don't know what a one percenter is, that's like Hell's Angels, the outlaws, you know, the the drugs, prostitution, murder type, comes in, and TJ's over there talking about Jesus with one of the guys, and you don't do that with the traditional looking church bus and a suit and tie guy. Nothing wrong with that, but there's different bait for different fish. You see what I'm saying? That's what I wish the other churches would get. This is just our bait. I come from a Baptist Pentecostal background. We're preaching the doctrine of Jesus, but get out of our way, man, because we're having fun doing it. And uh, we don't think rock and roll is going to send us to hell and all those other silly things. But yeah, so, and I lost my place. Yeah, so, uh uh-huh. Trojan. Okay, but that's what we are, and the actual core meaning of our name is, is the armor of God. It means the armor of God, the heavy metal armor of God found in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. But everybody assumes, see, because we have this Trojan horse, the horsey thing about us, and just like everything else here at HMCC, but even the name was designed to grab attention, if all the, now I want you to imagine this, if there was a lost person, an atheist, a devil worshiper, um, somebody lost that does not know Jesus, and let's just hypothetically here, they were told, you, see all these churches lined up down the street, you have to pick one to go to just once, or we're going to kill you right now. I know that's silly, but I'm just saying, imagine. So just like, um, so if all the different denominations and church names were on a list and a lost person was told, you must pick one church to visit or die, I guarantee they would pick ours. I guarantee it. Um, Just on a name. See, the modern day Pharisees rebuke us just because of a name. It's happened time and time again. Just the name. I've been told I'm a heretic and going to hell. Okay. But the lost people are intrigued. Now, I wish I could take credit for that. I can't, you know, because that genius move was, for me, was an accident. But for God, he knew what he was doing the entire time, you see, because I had, it come time, I had to name this church. It was like three days um, before launch, okay? And I had, it was like a, a week, maybe it was a week. But I had to name it because I couldn't just, I had to, you have to call it something, And I'm like, okay, and I'm sitting here Googling. I'm like, it can't be anything that anybody's ever heard of before, but they have to know it's of Jesus. 
So, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and finally I'm like, I'm, I'm praying for like three days, and finally I just feel this whew, through my head that goes, you already have a name, I gave it to you already. I'm like, uh-uh, you're gonna tell God, uh-uh, you know, like that, and all of a sudden I'm just thinking, I'm like, oh, the first heavy metal church of Christ, because I had to come up with a fictitious church. If you read the story, first timers, that pamphlet that we gave you today, if you read the story in there, I was talking about a fictitious church that had it, you know, like at first it starts as picketers at a Marilyn Manson concert. You're going to hell, you're going to hell, you know. But if it was us in this fictitious church called the First Heavy Metal Church of Christ, we would have put an envelope on their windows and said, hey, we hope you enjoyed the show tonight. We hope you get home safe. Um, but we would like, if you have had too much to drink, our bus is just right across the parking lot. Text this number. We'll take you home safe because you are special to God and you are special to us. Now, what kind of an impression would that have left on lost people instead of, you're going to burn in hell? I mean, is hell real? Absolutely. But you can't scream that at lost people. They don't have the Holy Spirit inside of them. They don't have, have discernment. You have to love them to Jesus and get out of God's way, teach them the truth in love, but you're not going to get somebody to come and visit your house of worship by standing there with a megaphone and a sign on the outskirts of the lot screaming at them as they're going in. I want to be in there with them and offer to love them and make sure they get it home safe because if they die on their way home, we know where they're going and we don't want them to go there, right? Right? The knuckleheads on the corner shouldn't, should know this. Maybe they're inbred. It is a dark world. I heard banjos, I thought, when coming, when, you know. And it's the same way with the abortion clinic thing. You got the same knucklehead. You're going to hell. Man, no matter what that woman does, decides, man, she's going to need the forgiveness of Christ and the love of Christ. I'm not saying abortion's right, but I'm saying if she's going to do it, she's going to do it. But she still needs to know Jesus Christ. And uh, so many people live in regret for the rest of their lives, and Satan just keeps pounding that in them. That's, you know, I, I want to love them. And let them know that they can be forgiven. Jesus loves them. And don't hold your head in shame. You didn't know better. Now you do. You see what I'm saying? Isn't that better than you whore? You're going to hell. You know, don't you get more bees with honey than vinegar? You know what I'm saying? I've had many people throughout the years come up and say, now that I am saved and trying to walk this path with Christ, why does it seem like my life has fallen apart? I've heard that a lot. The answer and I've been saying it for years, and I've said it a while back here today, Satan does not mess with those that are sitting on the bench for Team Jesus. You have to make an active choice to serve God. Anybody can come in here and sit for a couple hours. And heck, I, sh I shouldn't feel anxiety that I'm going too long because people want to get out of here. But seriously, I mean, this, if this is the one day a week that you give to God, give it to God without limitation or expectation from me. You know, you're just not a threat. You will never be a threat until you decide to get in the game. He doesn't care if you have a perfect church attendance on Sundays and midweek groups. He doesn't care if you sit at home and post scriptures on Facebook all day. Like that is doing something because trust me, most lost people get sick of that. You know what? Back when my, you know, like I, I was saved, but I was in the desert. I used to unfollow people that all they did was post um, cheesy Jesus cartoons with scripture and all this kind of stuff because it was kind of cheesy, okay? I know they meant well, don't get me wrong, but it's like lost people, you know, will unfollow and I I've seen it because they get on saved Christians that's not all in. You know, what I'm not making sense. I'm just trying to be transparent back when I used to be that way. Trust me, lost people get sick of that and you're, you're only catching the eye of Christians for the most part or backsliders that hit rock bottom, which is great and all, but once you start getting fresh ink in the Lamb's Book of Life, watch out because now you have a target on your back. 
That's uh, one of, there was a buddy of mine that he doesn't go to church. He'll claim Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He doesn't go to church. And when I told him this idea back in the, oh boy, you better stay prayed up and you better watch it. And I'm like, why? He goes, don't you understand what you're doing? You pretty much kicked the front door to Satan's house down, walked right in, looked at him and smiled and flipped him the bird. Because we're having church in a bar at that time. You know what I'm saying? You got a target on your back, you know, if you are actively trying to make disciples of all men and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you have a poster of you down in hell, hell's most wanted, because you're going against uh, their agenda. Heavy Metal Church has had four significant church splits in 10 years and seven months. I mean significant. And unfortunately, it won't be the last. I tell, I tell everybody after you know, we finally get through it. It won't be the last. Stay on guard. I tell my leadership team all the time, watch for discord, watch for gossip, slander, anybody that's coming at me or coming at, you know, whatever, because it, it's, you're sitting in here somewhere. We just don't know who you are. That's scary too, to stand up here and say, I mean, who do you think is responsible for that? The church splits, you know, I mean, that is, that's Satan, plain and simple. It's because he will plant some tares, and when the tares grow, they form alliances, and then when something happens, they will uh, raise all sorts of hell, and when they leave, they will take people with them, and whatever, you know, whatever. But what I'm not okay with are the innocent people. There's been so many innocent people that got caught in the middle and didn't know what to do. That's who I am concerned for, because then they just quit going to church. Why? Because of immature Christians that didn't get their way or tares mixed in. I mean, it's just a long story, but, but you know, I pray for those people that got caught in the middle because they need to be somewhere. I wish they were with us, you know, but that's what Satan does. He'll use anything and anyone. So many people, they find their church home here. Satan's not okay with that. He knows that this is the only place that a lot of you are going to go to church now. So he doesn't want you here. I couldn't go back to a traditional church after heavy metal church. And there's nothing, I'm not saying, I mean, those are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Even the ones that hate us and tell us we're going to hell because of our name and skulls on our shirts and whatever. I still believe they're saved. I just believe they're deceived. I believe they don't know God's word as much as they claim they do. And I know this church isn't for everyone. And if I stumbled across it, I would be like, what? But I would check out what they believe. That nobody can find anything wrong with our what we believe page at all. We just have some awesome tactics and we drive cool vehicles to save the lost, man. That's, you know, so, hey. Um, <coughs> hold on. Um, and it, it is a tragedy what happens to the people in the middle, but God does shake the tree here every now and then, every few years too, because that's healthy. We do have rotten fruit every now and then that is nothing but a drag and a pull and a kind of like a want, 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 an Eeyore to the congregation, you know? Go Eeyore somewhere else, man, because we need to stay positive and moving. Well, there's bad times coming. You guys know this, right? Please, please, I hope you're not blind. The reason this happens so often in this church is because this church scares the crap out of Satan. Well, how, how can a church scare the crap out of, out of the devil? Well, it's not Brian Smith. It's the fact that God has built this Trojan horse-ish, this Trojan horse that reaches people that Satan thought he had in the bag. You see what I'm saying? I mean, look, when God can bring three actual Satan worshipers to Christ, Satan, I'm talking, and I even confirmed with uh, one of the most recent ones, I was like, so let me get this straight. You actually bowed to and worshiped the devil. She goes, yes. And I used to uh, summons demons to go after people that were blah, 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 or, and I, she couldn't stand Christians because she had a... <laughs> bad experience with Christians that give Jesus a bad name most of her life. So it's like when God can bring a devil worshiper, somebody that Satan huh, in the bag, in the bag to come around and do a full 180 and now has the power through the Holy Spirit to go speak with other devil worshipers. Yeah. Don't that just woo, you know, and 
I would hate heavy metal church too if I was the devil. And again, it ain't Brian Smith. I'm not that smart or good looking to be pulling this off, man. It's, I am proof and you are proof that just the scripture says, God will use the foolish to confound the wise. And that's what the first heavy metal church of Christ is, man. So when God can bring three actual Satan worshipers to Christ and all the atheists and agnostics throughout the years and all the people that would never step foot into a traditional church, trust me, Satan knows all about the first heavy metal church of Christ, okay? And no matter how many times I warn people of this, I warn them, they would say, yeah, I know. It ain't gonna get me out of here, man, because I'm God's got me all jazzed up and I'm powerful for the Lord. A couple years go by, this church has had a huge turnover rate throughout the years, man. But that's okay because I've read articles before, um, a church that has a high turnover rate, a church that has a high fluctuated attendance. Like one week we might have 100, the next week we might have 150, I mean, whatever. But that shows that you're reaching lost people because they're baby Christians. They don't have it in their agenda to go to church every week. You see what I'm saying? Like, if you go to, to me, I was brought, you go to church, that is, that's the day you give God every week with little to no exception, all right? But people that are new to the Lord, they're not there yet. So a fluctuating attendance is okay. We have lost some amazing evangelists here throughout the years due to people coming here and, and joining a clique or coming here and getting too caught up in what they shouldn't have been caught up in and then Satan gets them every time. I've seen this happen numerous times. They find a boyfriend or girlfriend and then break up or take it all the way to marriage and then get divorced. But nine times out of 10, it's always drama, gossip, and pride that causes church splits especially here, and it's a tragedy, um, and causes people to leave, and, it, and it's people that truly need this place. You know, I, I've talked to people before that'll come in, I just, oh, I praise God that he led me here to heavy metal church, and then something happens a year later that has nothing to do with heavy metal church, but maybe a congregant of heavy metal church, a dating scenario, or something like that, and then they leave, because pride, they got their feelings hurt, Satan knows us better than we know ourselves. Once you're not fired up anymore, and he knows how to rattle your cage. He knows what kind of people to use to rattle your cage and get you to boot scooting because he don't want you to be effective. I'm watching the clock. You guys getting anything out of this? <clears throat> See, there's this thing called spiritual warfare. Say spiritual warfare and say it again. And many Christians just don't take it serious enough. You know, a lot of Christians take the devil as some little woogie woogie, you know, guy that comes out in a red tights and a, you know, no, he's very much real. He can't hurt God. He can't beat him in an arm wrestling match. He can't nothing. But he figured out how he can hurt God's heart. And that's by filling up the pit. With, with souls that God loves and now there's many souls that's gonna be without God for all of eternity. That's how Satan hurts God. It's like sticking a knife in a, in a wound that's already a wound and that's what he's doing to God. And he's gonna get his someday. But that's why we gotta take saving souls serious. So what is spiritual warfare and what does the Bible say about it? So basically that's what our series is going to be about today is an introduction to spiritual warfare and to the full armor of God. And we're going to go through each and every piece. So I don't know how long that's going to take, but who cares, right? There are two primary errors when it comes to spiritual warfare. Now listen up. The first is overemphasis and the second is underemphasis. The first is overemphasis, and the second is underemphasis. Some blame every sin, every conflict, and every problem on demons that need to be cast out. That there is a demon under every rock. The devil made me do it. Listen, I don't need much help from the devil to screw up. I don't. Do you? I don't. There's enough in society now, TV, commercials, uh, whatever. Hey, Google, show me you know what I mean? We don't need much help to screw up. Satan is very much real, and he does tempt us 
to fall and all of this kind of stuff. But some people, again, you've heard me reference it a thousand times. Oh man, that devil's just messing with me this week. Why? Well, I got a flat tire on the way to work or I got written up at work. Well, why? For being late. Well, are you late a lot? Well, yeah. Well, hey, dummy, quit being late. That ain't the devil. That's your laziness. We've all, Scott, you ever been late to work? Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, Three times a week? No, right. Okay. And that's what I'm talking about. That's not the devil. That is your poor work ethic. Okay. Um, They will even blame little life inconveniences like flat tires on the devil coming at them. Then others completely ignore the spiritual realm and the fact that the Bible tells us our battle is against spiritual powers. The key to successful spiritual warfare is finding the biblical balance. Jesus sometimes cast demons out of people and sometimes healed people with no mention of the the demonic. Everything is not demons all the time, okay? They're real. They're there. I'm not negating that, but not, oh, there's a demon under that speaker that caused my you know, the, it to pop and crack, the speaker to pop and crack in the middle of my salvation message. Now, can he do that? Yes. Is it possible? Yes. If somebody was getting, I get that. But every little thing is not a gremlin. Belts go out on cars. Microphones go out. Cords always go out. Right, Rex? Rex? Oh, he's, never mind. Shh. He worked late last night. So um, the Apostle Paul instructs Christians to wage war against the sin in themselves, Romans 6, and to wage war against the evil one, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Now Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 declares, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This scripture teaches some crucial truths. We can only be strong in the Lord's power if we have on the full armor of God. And that our battle is against spiritual forces of evil in the world. You got to understand, this little... Five, what is it, five pounds, 10 pounds? How much is a head weigh? I thought that was, huh? About 10? Uh, this little 10 pound object of beauty right here, except for John. Um, I'm kidding, John, I love you. But listen, the battle's taking place here, okay? It is, this is the battlefield right here. And um, a powerful example of someone strong in the Lord's power is Michael the archangel in Jude. Michael, likely the most powerful of all of God's angels, did not rebuke Satan in his own power, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Revelation 12, 7 and 8 uh, records that at the end times, Michael will defeat Satan. Still, when it came to his conflict with Satan, Michael rebuked Satan in God's name and authority, not his own. And we're talking angels, man. Some angels could just squash us just like that. And these are two angels. Michael, the most powerful angel, still does it under the authority and the blessing of of Christ, of God. It is only through our relationship with Jesus Christ that Christians have any authority over Satan and his demons. It is only in Jesus' name that our rebuke has any power. I meet cocky Christians all the time that come off as if they are badasses against Satan. You know, I'm serious. It scares me to hear the way they talk, man, like some kind of spiritual Arnold or Chuck Norris. But in reality, you know what we are? Have you ever been, have you ever, when when I was a kid, I remember this one kid, he was a brat. I was probably 11 and he was coming and messing with me and my friends at this party that our, my mom took me to of her friends. And there was this one kid, he kept coming up, throwing stuff at us. And then we would take off to run to get him. And then he'd come up and grab his mom or dad's leg and sit there and go, you get the picture? Okay. And it's like, you know, now, you know, I don't want to beat any kids up or anything. I mean, I was 11, but it's like, you know, yeah, come back around the house. You ain't going to be so tough. You know what I'm saying? And he never did. He's like, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. That was the game he was playing, okay? We are that kid. 
When it comes to Satan, you gotta understand, we are that kid that hangs on to that parent's leg sticking their tongue out at the older kids. Because without that parent, we're done. If, if we got a hold of that kid, he would have had a wedgie up to his ears. All right? He would, yeah, it wouldn't have been pretty. But he had the power of the parent, and we weren't going to mess with that. Don't get cocky. We only have the power through the blood and the name of Christ. If you start getting arrogant, like, ah, I've got, in the net, you know, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I hope you do. I've met a lot of people like that. The power is not yours. Lord, it's thine. You know that song, the power is not mine. I give it to you, Lord, it's thine. And you have to remember that. Stay humble. I don't, I can say it until I'm blue in the face and you still won't listen. God does not like pride. He does not like ego. He does not like arrogance. Those three things are what got Satan kicked out of heaven. So why on earth would we ever want to be like that? And we are filled with pride, ego, and arrogance, especially Americans. All right? So remember that. He loves humble Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. Guys, it is 145. We're going to go 10 more minutes, and I'm going to call the praise team up. Ephesians 6, 13 through 18 gives a description of the spiritual armor God gives us. We are to stand firm with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, and by praying in the Spirit. Now, what do these pieces of spiritual armor represent in spiritual warfare? We are to speak the truth against Satan's lies. We are to rest in the fact that we are declared righteous because of Christ's sacrifice for us. We are to proclaim the gospel no matter how much resistance we receive. We are not to waver in our faith no matter how strongly we are attacked. Our ultimate defense is the assurance we have of our salvation, an assurance that no spiritual force can take away. Our offensive weapon is the word of God, not our own opinions and feelings. We are to follow Jesus' example in recognizing that some spiritual victories are only possible through prayer. Now, I'll tell you this right now, those six and a half years, I, if you know my story, where I just wanted to die, I was so miserable, but I was more afraid of God and what my life would be like for the rest of my life if I walked away from the greatest adventure of my life that God gave me than it killing me. That was a scary place to be in. And I praise God that he gave me the strength to persevere so that I'm still standing up here before you this day because I love my job for God now. Two and a half years, love it. It's 10 and a half years, 10 years and seven months old. I've absolutely scared to death the first two years, miserable, hated it, hated life for the next six and a half years. This two and a half years, I have, God has strengthened me and I am having the time of my life. And if this lasts one more day or for 40 more years, I praise God and I wanna give up my best and I want you to be there with me, amen? But it's going to take, it's going to take people on the field. I, I, I've said it a thousand times. It, it's, it's always the goal of pastors to get, oh, I got to get a new building and get bigger and bigger. And then, oh, I got to build another building. I don't want, we can reach the entire world right here from Dayton, Ohio. And we do. We're mailing out, um, we're mailing out t-shirts to Germany on Monday. Okay, I've, I've got friends because of this all over the world. We've got our pamphlet being printed in German right now. Okay, so this is amazing. We can reach the world from here. This place holds 500 um, people. I don't want this place to ever get bigger than three or 400. At one point, it, we had, uh, if everybody showed up on the same day, 400 and some uh, people. And then at our last major church split, uh, and then COVID hit right after that. COVID screwed everybody up in church attendance. And, uh, and look, we're still going. You know what I'm saying? And what did we say? We said, well, seriously, the church, we are the church. That's why we don't really get scared about the building because we'll go set up in a parking lot with the coach and use that FM transmitter we've got. 
we're not afraid because this world is going to throw us some curveballs. We can't be afraid of change. We got to keep pressing forward and adapt, over, overcome and adapt. Amen. So let's see how much time. Okay, okay, six more minutes. Um, Jesus is our ultimate example for spiritual warfare. Observe how Jesus handled direct attacks from Satan when he was tempted by him in the wilderness. Now, this is Jesus, okay? Fully human, fully man. I mean, fully human, fully God. Matthew 4, 1 through 11 says, each temptation was answered the same way. With the words, Jesus would say, it is written. Jesus knew the word of the living God is the most powerful weapon against the temptations of the devil, if Jesus himself used the word to counter the devil, do we dare use anything less? Sad thing is, is far too many Christians are so Bible ignorant that they don't even know what to say. They don't know what to say. The ultimate example of how not to engage in spiritual warfare is the seven sons of Sceva. Some Jews who went around trying to drive out evil spirits by thinking they could invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. The seven sons of Sceva and a Jewish chief priest were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them back. Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? <whistles> then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a whooping that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. That's a whooping. Whew. Acts 19, 13 through 16, the seven sons of Sceva were using Jesus' name. That is not enough. The seven sons of Sceva did not have a relationship with Jesus. Therefore, their words were void of any real power or authority. Now, here's the thing. There is just the name of Jesus will make a demon tremble. So I picture it like this with the Sceva thing. The demon probably heard the name of Jesus. You know, when they, the name of Jesus, the, the demon was probably like, oh, uh oh, uh oh. And then looked and was like, ah, that was a close call, you know, like that. And then went and kicked her butt. False alarm. The seven sons of Sceva were relying on a methodology. They were not relying on Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they were not employing the word of God in their spiritual warfare. As a result, they received a humiliating beating. We need to learn from their bad example and conduct spiritual warfare as the Bible instructs us to. So we're going to re let's see. We're going to stop right at going into the full armor of God. So here, so what are the keys to success in spiritual warfare? Praise team, you can come on out. First, we rely on God's power and not our own. Second, we rebuke in Jesus' name, not our own. Third, we protect ourselves with the full armor of God. Fourth, we engage, we wage warfare with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And finally, we remember that while we wage spiritual warfare against Satan and his demons, not every sin or problem is a demon that needs to be rebuked. A fun little fact uh, about Satan is that he cannot be everywhere at once, okay? He's probably dealing with Middle East and world leaders and all that stuff right now. I told you before, uh, we've, you've got guardian angels. Well, we've got demons that are assigned to us that do what they do, and I call mine Lenny and Squiggy because, um, you know, what? I, I just, it's just what I do. And, um, but I know he must know about us, and I don't say that again with ego, pride, or arrogance uh, or boasting but of just how powerful and severe some of the attacks that I have had in the past 10 and a half years, unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. And again, when God has done something to be able to reach Satan worshipers and atheists and everything like that, there's a war going on, man. And we all need to stay together and prayed up and read Bible up and be together as that family that I know we are. As the years pass, it's like, you know, Betty, Barb. I mean, I'm, I'm looking around, but Scott, you, you and Andy, I feel are a part of this family now, and you haven't been here for that long. I hope you feel that way. And um, you two knuckleheads right there, love you both. Uh, you know, I'm messing with you. He'll beat you up. He'll, yeah, don't mess with that guy. He's, he's amazing. Um, but anyway, this is the family, and we have to, we're in this together. It's no joke. So with that being said, I'd like you all to bow your heads. Um, this, this wasn't... You know, we're going into a series. I hate, I never did like series, but I think this is 
this is important because most of my life, people would say, well, just gird up with the full armor of God. I'm like, okay, well, how? Well, you got to have the belt of truth and the, so, you know, and they don't explain, well, how's this belt of truth? You know, how's that going to protect me? And how's this, you know what I'm saying? What's this helmet? Yeah, I know all about armor, but when you're fighting a war of the mind and a spiritual battle with, with enemies you can't even see, that's like just standing here with a sword and all this stuff and being like, okay, where you at? You know, it's all taking place right here. So I hope that after the end of this series, we will know how to use these weapons within our mind. Why does the belt of truth, why is it needed in our mind to protect us from the attacks of the devil? That's how I hope to do this in the next couple of weeks, okay? So with that being said, we're going to say, uh, we're going to pray. Um, you know, I don't know where our first timers are with God, where you're at in your lives. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out, but God told me a long time ago, praise God, uh, 10 years and seven months, and we have never had a, a service without at least one first time visitor. And God put on my heart, I don't know if I'll ever see you again. And I just want you to know that so many people think they've been taught that you have to clean up before you come to Christ that, you know, you got to stop doing this and this and this, and then you can come to church, and that's not how it works. You can't clean yourself up good enough for a, a holy, perfect God, and uh, without the Holy Spirit in your heart, it's an endless battle anyway, and it takes time of sanctification and God cleaning you up, and I don't know about you, but it's a lifetime cleanup process. Can anybody agree with that? Amen. So, I'm just here to tell you so many people that's come to our, across our path that believe everything they need to believe to be saved. They believe that Jesus walked this earth, that he was who he says he was, that he died on the cross for our sins, that God raised him from the dead three days later. He's coming back again. Romans 10 says that if you just confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But it doesn't mean you're going to walk out that door perfect. And I've said it a thousand times, if you walked in here a douchebag today and you get saved, you're going to walk back out a douchebag. But you've got the Holy Spirit in your heart. And as you actively seek God, he's going to seek you and clean you up along the way. And then the second type is people that we go through periods in life. I've been through it. A lot of you have been through it. Most of you have been through it where you, they call it backsliding or you're, you end up walking away for whatever reason. You still love the Lord and you still believe, but you just woke up one day and you're chasing your tail in the desert. And then Satan wants you to run and hide and stay hidden to make you think that God's mad at you just like he did Adam and Eve in the garden. That's not the case. He loves you as much as he did um, before you were born because he created and designed you. And there's nothing that you have ever done or will ever do that will make God love you any more, any less than he already does. He just wants you to turn around. He's true and just to forgive a repentant heart. And he wants you to turn around and see him standing right there. He's never left you. And he's going to crotch down and hold his arms wide open and catch you. And you're going to walk off like nothing ever happened, hand in hand. And you're going to resume and pick up where you left off. But we're going to say a prayer. If you want to rededicate your heart to Jesus, if you're watching or listening, or if you want to be saved, you've never been saved. You believe everything, but you've never been saved. Do it now. Don't wait. There's no prerequisite to be saved. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And we're going to pray it all together in case somebody in here wants to pray that along with us or somebody at home. If you want to be saved, say it right there at the computer, but just follow after me. Father God. In the name of Jesus, I confess now that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Father, please forgive me for all of my sins. Please cover them with the blood of Jesus. Please guide my steps from this day forward and use me as you wish. I ask this with all of my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that prayer for the very first time, listen, I want you to email me, bsmith at heavymetalchurch.com, 
and I will tell you what to do next. I'm working on a paper right now that we can give out. I should have had this done years ago, but hey, you know, better late than never. But it just, when you come to Christ, it shows what to do next, where to go, what to do, and how to seek him. Uh, write me at bsmith at heavymetalchurch.com, same way with anybody in here, and I'll tell you the next steps to take. And God bless you all. Thank you for being here today. Bring somebody to service next week as we continue on with the armor of God. We'll see you guys later. But door 57's gonna melt your face first.
Praise God. Thank you.